Hello, my name is Sebastian Grosse Puppendal and uh, I'm a policy officer at ECDPM, the European Centre for Development Policy Management. And we are in an, in an exciting year, 2015. Um, the next month and, and, and weeks will shape the global agenda, or supposed to shape the global agenda for the next 15 years until 2030. And this will be an agenda which will be very different from the Millennium Development Goals in the sense that it will not be an agenda only decided by the North, but it is based on large consultations that took place over the last years. In September, the world will agree on the Sustainable Development Goals at the United Nations General Assembly. And uh, this will be followed by the COP21 meeting in Paris, which will hopefully reach an ambitious climate change agreement and in the WTO Ministerial Conference in Nairobi in December, will then discuss issues related to trade. Now, the main focus will however be on the um, Financing for Development Conference taking place in Addis next week, um, which will discuss um, some of the policies and financial issues which hopefully contribute to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Reaching an ambitious agreement um, on Financing for Development will be key to reach targets and goals of the post-2015 development agenda. And therefore, um, the importance of the Addis Conference is one of the reasons why I'm here today with Hanne Knappen from the um, food uh, security team. Um, she's a policy officer with a particular focus on climate change and uh, climate financing. And I'm also here with San Bilal and, and Bruce Byers, um, who are working in the economic transformation and trade team as respectively head of program and senior policy officer. So as a first issue, I would like to come to the question what the Addis Conference can actually change in the financing for development debate. And uh, here I would like to ask Bruce, what is your stake on that? Um, well, I, I kind of have two different views. One, slightly, is, I guess, is the positive one, that uh, indeed you can see that there's a change in terms of the way that all these different actors are beginning to talk about universality and talk about all being in this together. Um, so in a way, the Addis Conference, I think, is, a, is an opportunity to send a kind of political message of some form of agreement that is global, um, which sort of updates a little bit the agenda from where things were with the, with the, with the Millennium Development Goals. So that's the positive side. But I think on the, on the other side, though, if we're asking what does the conference change on the development debate, on the financing for development debate, I'm not sure how much it really will change. I mean, if we think genuinely about how development processes take place and who the policymakers are who take decisions, who allocate budgets within governments, if we think about private sector investors, you mentioned private sector, are they really taking decisions that depend on some agreement made in Addis? I'm, I'm slightly more skeptical. So I think Yes, it, it'll be good to send a message and it may sort of build some momentum in terms of talking about sort of how to do these things together. But then really in the end, it comes down to policies. What are the policies at the country level and even more locally? And how are those put into practice? And that we're actually even talking about politics there, local politics. And to me, I see a big gap between Addis and, and what takes place on the ground. Okay, so I see there's a mixed, mixed attitude towards that. Yes, I, mean, I think skepticism is always... Uh uh, a good way to start, but one should recognize the narrative is changing. Yeah. And the MDGs was really embodied into the development cooperation framework, where aid had a central role, where the commitments on finance to reach the Millennium Development Goals was about uh, 0 0.7 uh, or obviously development assistance, mm -hmm. and thinking that by providing good development assistance in the right place, we could just reduce poverty. And now I think there's the narrative is that the sources of finance and the question of finance is broader than development cooperation, and development cooperation uh, is only a small part of it. So I think in that sense it is quite interesting, and, and, and the fact that there's also an increasing recognition of the role of the private sector, which I agree with you, Bruce, has always been there, and so in that sense one could say it's not new, but I think, in, again, in terms of the narrative, the fact that there's a recognition that there are different flows of finance that can come and contribute to the transformation opens up the, the debate. And probably more than necessarily, the, uh, I would say, the, the outcome of the Addis Conference, which will be important, especially for development agencies and some of the development actors, but uh, it's the overall discussion that took place uh, beforehand, and I hope that will follow that forces everybody to think about how can we harness the resources that we need 
for development. This is a very interesting point and also is in line with one of the or some of the findings of the of the recent European report on development, which is looking at financing and other policies of for um, for a transformate, transformative post two thousand fifteen agenda, and 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 it, this report actually says that we need a different approach, that we need some sort of a new approach which considers all financial um, sources and which is also considering financing and policies together. So would you like to, to come in there as well? Well, the European Report on Development indeed makes the contribution that, uh, I think the key contribution is that in the general debate we have been talking about what are the financial needs and therefore trying to quantify these financial needs and see what is the gap to achieve uh, what is the finance re required to m meet the gap that we have in terms of finance, and especially in terms of uh, ODA financing that was not sufficient, and we need to move from uh, what the multinational, uh, uh, multilateral uh, development banks have called uh, going from uh, uh, billions to trillions, and so you try to, to cover this financing gap. Now, the, uh, the European Report on Development is saying this is maybe the wrong way of asking the question because, in fact, how much money is required for development is very difficult to quantify. And it's not just the money. You cannot look at the money alone. You have to look at the context and, and what are the policies that are required. So um, let's take, um, I mean, given the, the, the current situation uh, in Europe, let's take the case of Greece, uh, where you have uh, Greece having to pay back its debt but having very... Uh, uh, no growth or negative growth for that matter, uh, if they don't put the reform, in, uh, structural reforms in place, and if they don't have a growth policy, paying back the debt will never be possible. So the question is not what is the debt you have to, uh, and what is the amount of money you need to be able to pay back the debt, but it's what is the tr transformation that, you will take, that will take place at the country level, uh, and the policies that will be put in place so that you will generate growth, and then you will transform your economy, have more finance, and then be able to, uh, to, to match that gap. Now, for most developing countries and uh, African countries, fortunately, for most of them, the issues of debt is less important, though it could come back, but it's been less important. So the issue is not to generate finance to cover uh, uh, debt repayments, but it's about uh, financing their development and their transformation. So how much money you will need is de really highly dependent on the type of policies that you are putting in place. Uh, what are the enablers that are there and, and also how effectively. Another example, and I'll stop there, but if you build infrastructure, and we all know that there's a need for bigger infrastructure, you can build an additional port, but if the regulatory system is not conducive and if there's blockages and corruptions, your new port will not be efficient. So how much new capacities you need and new infrastructure you need also depend on the uh, capacity to use them efficiently and that depends on policies. So there's a, tr there's a strong connection between policies and finance. Mm -hmm. Taking the point of infrastructure, that's actually an interesting one looking at that infrastructure needs to be climate neutral, um, carbon neutral. So if I may ask Hanne if you would like to come in with, with regard to climate financing. What are the main what are the main issues um, probably relevant for for next week's conference? Yeah, I think the Addis conference could offer great opportunities for um, to to come to um, to a common understanding of climate finance. At present, there is no uh, universal understanding of the fair sharing of the financial burden for um, to tackle climate change. So any project, as you just mentioned, any project, an infrastructure project, can be uh, labeled as a as a climate project. So it's very important that. Um, all the all the parties come to um, to a system of classifying what a climate project is, and then consequently what is what is climate finance. Uh, another issue that is very important um, in the debate on climate finance is the role of the private sector. That has already been discussed here. Um, we we know that public um, funding is decreasing. So um, when the, the role of the private sector, the role of the private sector in mobilizing resources is becoming increasingly important, but there are also issues related to that. And one um, important issue is that this could be a way for governments to, to shift their legal and moral responsibility to the private sector. Another uh, problem is that um, we know that the most important climate fund in the coming years will be the Green Climate Fund. 
And uh, the aim is to um, to mobilize 100 billion US dollars per year by 2020, and then this fund will be released. So, um, and the private sector will play a very important role there. But at present, um, they are not sure what type of funding this should be from the from the private sector. And then, um, until until now, uh, we see that there are many examples of private sector funding for mitigation projects, for energy project, be, energy projects, because there is an interesting uh, financial return, but when it comes to adaptation projects, it is more challenging to, to uh, mobilize the, the private sector. So um, this, the ADIS conference would be, it's very important to find answers to these kind of questions. And, and uh, yeah. Is the classification, though, of... of uh, environmental finance not a question mainly for donors and, and for accountability because that reminds me a lot of the discussion we, we had about aid for trades mm -hmm. uh, which was very important in 2005 uh, to give a stronger impetus on, on the need for finance uh, for trade and, and then when I hear the, the discussion on uh, climate finance yeah. uh, and especially this issue of, of classification I wonder if it's not just more for donors to say well you have to to focus on the dimension of the environment, which, as for trade, has been extremely helpful, mm -hmm. it is less clear if it has really helped to mobilize additional finance or if there's been some kind of substitution effect. And that will be even more so when one is including private finance and not simply ODA. What's your take on that? Um, I think by not having a strong classification of projects, there are risks uh, linked to that. For example, money can be used... Can be can be double counted when you are not having a clear framework for climate projects. Yeah, but I think I think I think what's interesting maybe is also I mean double counting still I think goes back to the point about who's who's doing the counting and what's the counting for. Is it just to be able to show how much money went to a different thing, or is it about? And to me that kind of takes back to my initial point about it's the stuff about the practice on the ground. And I think and I and I guess in the climate finance uh, working with the private sector it becomes the same issue that there is sort of more generally in terms of working with the private sector for development, that the private sector funds come in different types and they go in quite specific areas. So trying to kind of imagine that sort of the, the volume of private funds is, is enough of an indicator that something is being done, I think sort of covers up the fact that these funds are going into very specific areas. And okay, you might be able to classify it into sp sort of specific targets, um, but... I think that the, the private sector story, I think there's a, there's a kind of an important distinction to be made between sort of private sector investment, which is taking place, which is taking place anyway, and on kind of on a commercial basis, but that has a, a development and potentially climate impact. And then there's sort of the, the private sector finance, which is sort of swishing around looking for profitable projects to go into. And even within those two, then, I think there's still a distinction to be made between where it's a sort of public sector goal where we have, for example, if sort of not so much in climate, I guess, but we have sort of public sector goals or targets which are set up trying to attract the private sector money, but then we also have the private sector money going in where you have public sector money following and trying to make it more developmental and more climate friendly. And to me, these distinctions kind of disappear when we start talking about funds and classifications and things and when those distinctions disappear, we're sort of sort of missing a lot of the nuance that becomes important in terms of how it plays out on the ground, which then goes back to the story about sort of, okay, you finance a port or you finance a road, but actually it's the, it's the sort of the political systems around it which make, which make the big difference. Um, so if you're working in a specific environment and you're not able to kind of work out where the genuine political interest is, not just political will, but where the political interest is, then... Some of these things kind of risk uh, sort of carrying on a bit like we've had up to now, that not having much impact. Yeah, thanks. This is very interesting. Honey, you mentioned before that there is um, a decreasing share of ODA, of, of, of the traditional aid, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned the private finance stuff. So is there probably a different role for public money uh, to be played, Bruce, in, in the sense that, that ODA could potentially perform a different function than it did in the past in relation also to private, private finance then? Well, I think so, because I think one of the, I mean, one of the results also that, or not result really, but one of the sort of statistics presented in the ERD is that since 2002, the Monterey consensus, uh, public aid increased by something like 0.1 of a trillion uh, dollars, while privates or 
first of all, domestic resource mobilization went up by 4 trillion and private sector finance by 3 trillion. So the scales that we're talking about are completely, are completely different, um, which again pushes you, this, this is where donors are being pushed to think more about how to use this small and in some cases declining uh, levels of aid. And I think, but the point isn't that it's not got a place anymore, but just that how it's used, I think yeah, I can kind of see two sort of main things. One obviously is for the poorest of the poor, there are emergency situations where there is a case of almost sort of logistics sort of humanitarian aid and, and resolving issues at that level. But then also what's happening more and more is using the donors trying to use aid to catalyze some of this additional investment. And I think catalyzing private sector investment and also potentially catalyzing more domestic uh, public resources. So by, by focusing on uh, tax reform and trying to understand how or sort of what some of the barriers are to raising domestic resources is another way where, where ODA can still be used and, and have an effective role. Okay. Yeah, ODA will remain uh, useful. Uh, probably what is interesting in, in Addis and, and what will be discussed also in New York is, is the change again of approach that are, that are taking in the sense that it, it is becoming under the Sustainable Development Goals it is becoming less donor centric, so it means that the also for donors uh, they have to think about how the aids the, the little amount of aid that they have, which can be significant for some countries, and mm -hmm. let's not forget it. Yeah. So it's not to say that aid is marginal, but in the broader schemes, how can you use your aid in the most strategic way? to leverage uh, development and unlock some of the principles. So they should probably focus on public goods, on areas where uh, it is more difficult to uh, uh, to find uh, private finance or other type of finance or even uh, loans and so on. Uh, the question, of course, of blending, mixing loans and grants and, and, and trying to see how that can also be a catalyst for uh, development is, is a welcome uh, uh, development. Uh, probably the, the role of uh, development banks uh, and, and development finance institutions uh, is going to become also increasingly important. So there will be a question also of donors. Uh, how do they link up at the national level between their development finance institutions and the role as donors agency? Some are doing that quite well, uh, Germany or, or, or France. Some others uh, in Europe are, have are struggling much more and, and it's more difficult to find the synergy between what they're doing. But I think the main point is to realize that uh, aid is no, it is not central to development uh, and therefore there is a need also in terms of approach to take a more modest role for, uh, for development agencies, which is a bit in contradiction with the push they are under, uh, especially in Europe, where there is a need for greater accountability justify taxpayers' money, show your impact all the time. So they have, a, they have a need to claim for more results than maybe one should expect from, uh, from donors' uh, donors' money. You mentioned that it's sometimes difficult for the private sector to invest because of certain issues, that it's probably not attractive for private finance to come in. That's also an issue of risk, a commercial risk, but also political risk. So is there probably also a role for ODA in terms of risk mitigation that could be played? Yeah, that's a very tricky role in a sense because it is true that typically investment in Africa uh, is, uh, is deemed to be difficult, is deemed to be risky, but it seems that and there is an emerging consensus that it's more the perceived risk that mm -hmm. is high, uh, but that the real risk on investment is not necessarily uh, that high. So the question is how can you have a demonstration effect it's just the role of uh, development finance institutions, maybe investing and showing that uh, it is not necessarily that risky. It is, uh, as you're mentioning, the question of uh, risk mitigation, uh, which is also appears to be very important. And so there's a question of how did you risk mitigation and provide instruments that indeed stimulate investment, but do not only stimulate investment from the richer countries to the developing world, but also benefit from the uh, investments uh, by the uh, developing countries themselves. Uh, and how do you avoid distorting competition and, and mm -hmm. saying that the risk is bared by the taxpayers, and that brings back to the accountability principle uh, that uh, uh, donors and in, in general public authorities have, uh, 
to say, well, we don't take over the risk that should be bared by the uh, by the banks or by the private sector actors. And I think following the uh, uh, you know the economic crisis and uh, financial crisis we we had globally, there is a legitimate concerns by taxpayers of saying why should we bear the risk for uh, uh, private uh, profits. Mm -hmm. We have talked a lot. Uh, if, you, if you want to come in. Yeah, I would like to come in again with the example of um, climate finance, this question. So um, within this, this new landscape of decreasing levels of ODA, um, we already discussed the, the, the importance of catalyzing the private sector and uh, the importance of, of blending also when it comes to climate projects. And um, it's also important, and this should be also on the agenda of the Addis Conference, that um, how can can um, governments in their in their own countries find new ways of uh, mobilizing climate finance, uh, finance, and uh, ways could be by um, exploring uh, financial transa transaction taxes, or um, there are the carbon taxes, another idea to to do this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this. Yeah, maybe just on, on, on this dimension of, of for domestic governments to, to understand uh, how it operates. And, and since we're talking about the role of uh, aid, uh, I think that's an important dimension is, is to move away from purely technical approaches to developments and to try to understand what are the processes at stake. And, and that is sometimes referred to change dynamics or political economy. But this is the kind of issues of what are the interests at stake, what are the, the power relationships that are taking place, who are the actors that are there. And too often there's not been enough understanding of the context on which um, development is taking place. And therefore there is a, you know, a technocratic approach to solution building to the problems that are identified. And I think that this is costly in a sense to try to bring that up in a more transparent manner. So there the role of donors in trying to identifying what are the the dynamics that are taking place in developing countries, but also within their own uh, their own uh, uh, agencies and, and, and process. So to try to understand what are the power relationship, make that more transparent, try to bring on board uh, a larger number of stakeholders uh, to identify these change dynamics is should definitely be one of the priorities of uh, of donors because that's an element where you need public finance that is a bit neutral and that is not necessarily captured yeah. by these vested interests they are supposed to to look at. I think that then raises the question of how donor agencies themselves are, are managing to adapt to this whole agenda change and the whole change in narrative. Okay. I mean, your your point about uh, measuring risk or perceived risk or whether it's uh, frankly, I don't think or at the moment at least, donor agencies aren't generally well prepared to understand those kind of risks or to measure them. Um, so in a way, they kind of are at a disadvantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the private sector that they're trying to engage with. Um, but that also then plays out in, in what you just said about the political economy part. I mean, I think to me that indeed is key. How the finance then filters down depends on the different relationships that are within countries where sort of the, the, these processes are taking place. And one of the questions that's being addressed more and more within this whole discussion is how even donors themselves can better understand and better adapt themselves as agencies. So move away from linear approaches of, okay, there's the problem, here's the money, that's how we go, to this kind of recursive adaptive process or, or approach to working um, sort of in projects. Or pro I mean, we're still even talking about projects and programs. Um, but I think that's kind of the big challenge in, in a way is, is the mindset uh, and how, and even if you have individuals within agencies, which you very often do, who are very well aware of the context they're working in, the question is whether the institutions they work for are able to kind of adapt to that, to that different way of thinking and, and kind of use these pieces of information. That's a very interesting point in the sense that, um, yeah, that's the kind of the role donors play, donor agencies play. Um, but then there's also... Africa, the African continent, um, which have a very different say, um, and, and domestic resource mobilization, for, for instance, is one of the, the main topics um, given, I mean, looking at the draft outcome document of the Addis Conference right now, uh, domestic resource mobilization is the first point, so there is a clear significance of that. Um, so I would like you to invite, um, I would like to invite you to, to, to discuss a bit about that and, and what is the relation of domestic resource mobiliz mobilization towards other sources of finance. Mm 
Well, I, I mean, I can I can come in to, the, to start to start the ball rolling there as well. I mean, part of the I think that the issue on, D, on D, domestic resource mobilization is that the tax system essentially is the basis of sort of state society relations. So the whole accountability of government is has now been shown through plenty of research to relate to the way that government or society sees the state. So you need this kind of in order for people to pay their taxes, they need to have a sense that they're being represented by a government which indeed is concerned about their own issues, that expends the money well. Um, so that sort of, even at a sort of broad accountability level, the, the tax issue and our domestic resource mobilization comes in very strongly. But then, of course, the way that taxes are applied then affects, again, the, the attitude of, 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 of people in society, but also the way businesses operate. So if... Uh, you set tax targets, which was actually one of the one of the sort of propositions during the run up to the Addis conference. Mm. There is actually uh, the risk that by setting targets that are too high, all you do is put pressure for sort of bad practices in terms of extracting taxes, which then worsens the business environment, which then makes it harder for investment, whether domestic or, or international. Yeah, it is definitely a good step for donors, since uh, I think it's only two or three percent of uh, donors' uh, funding that is going to. To, to support uh, tax reforms, which is rather small compared to uh, the, the traditional amount of, uh, of aid. But beyond that, I mean, I, I fully agree with what Bruce was saying, but I find the Addis debate is, is an interesting uh, catch-22. Uh, if you discuss with developing countries when they're among themselves, um, and, and I'm thinking there particularly about uh, Africa, is that it's very clear that the need to be able to mobilize their own resources, depend on their own resources to be able to uh, transform their economies, is becoming a priority for across the board. So that's something that, you know, compared to 10 years ago when they used to have these complaints about donors should do more, and if we have difficulties, it's because of, uh, uh, of, of former uh, colonial powers, and, and, and they should help us more. There is really this, this notion that uh, we need to transform ourselves and we will do so by industrializing uh, our economies, by engaging in structural transformation, and we'll have to depend on our own resources. Now, when it comes to the international debate, uh, as, as will take place in Addis, uh, and that's where the Catch-22 comes, is that you have on the other side... Uh, a donors community that also recognizes the importance of domestic resource mobilization. So I think the underlying ground everybody would agree, is, but with the donors community where the capacity to mobilize finance for development is reduced, mm -hmm. especially public finance. So the question is how, you know, there's a danger, of, or at least that's the perceived danger, uh, that donors are trying to reduce their engagement and saying, well, you know, aid is a declining role. We should, uh, you should count less on us. Our commitments are not as important anymore. What really matters is your domestic uh, resource mobilization. So kind of almost shifting the onus uh, on, on financial uh, development to the developing countries. Now you have to ask, what is the merit of having an overarching global agenda? To mobilize, domestic resource, uh, to mobilize your domestic resources, you don't need to have necessarily a global overarching mm. agenda. So exactly. you have a global overarching agenda. What you want is to get also uh, a commitment by your, uh, by your partners on, on, on in a certain direction. So then development countries tend to say, no, but you have to be strict on commitments on, uh, on aid. We have to tackle the question of illicit financial flows of the international tax regimes or tax corporations that should come in because these are issues that we cannot tackle at the, uh, at the domestic level. So while I think the underlying principles, everybody would probably agree, the emphasis that we see, yeah. and that's the discussion for Addis, is on different parts. Is, uh, you know, some of the donors are saying, well, of course, if we do more blending, more loans, more, res more catalyzing of, of private resources, we'll be able to show that there's more finance for developments, and yes, we have to do less. Uh, and the uh, the development countries are saying, well, you have a responsibility also for development. This is a global public good, and you should not be doing less. So the discourse in, that is taking place in Addis or New York is not necessarily the same as the one that is taking place in among uh, development countries, uh, for us, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I think we are here at the end. Um, I think that was a very interesting discussion. We heard some of the main issues and some of the main issues 
implications that need to be taken into consideration for next week's conference, but also beyond uh, in relation to, to New York and on, also to the, to the COP meeting in, yeah. in Paris. Um, so I thank you very much uh, for, you. for being here and, and discussing some of these things. And uh, I'm looking forward to an interesting uh, week next week in Addis. Thank you very much. Thank you.